Hey everyone, we know how hard it can be to keep up with the latest news here in Israel. So if you haven't had the time to stay on top of what's what here in the Holy Land, well, have no worries. I'm Tracy Alexander and this is ILTV's Weekly Review. Lockdowns across the country on the horizon and coronavirus infections spiking more and more every day, turning Israel into a warning story. Yet leadership is not only seemingly dragging its feet in response, the health, ministry, the health minister himself is actively ignoring his own restrictions. Catching fire from the public, Health Minister Yuli Edelstein is now trying to avoid public fury after attending a birthday party for his wife in violation of gathering size restrictions he himself announced. The move reminding Israelis of his predecessor's hypocrisy. Former Health Minister Yaakov Litzman having contracted COVID-19 by also breaking his own regulations. But Edelstein taking to social media, trying to explain his way out through a technicality, tweeting, Sorry to disappoint the fake news writers, but the event was in the open, where events could be held at the time, according to regulations. A 20-person restriction on such events did not exist, so everything was done according to regulations. The public, not buying it though, still noting that Edelstein announced the new regulations just hours before, and that they were set to go into effect just hours after the party started. Israeli President Reuven Rivlin getting in on the criticisms, calling for the formation of a central state body to respond to coronavirus with a clear doctrine, echoing warnings by senior health official Professor Sigat Sedetsky, who just resigned over the lack of clear government direction or action. Meanwhile, new daily infection rates remain at over 1,000. The total active cases in Israel hitting over 15,200, 118 in serious condition, and the death toll rising to 346. Jerusalem Affairs Minister Rafi Peretz now also becoming the latest government official to enter quarantine after a member of his office contracted the virus. Yet the health ministry has delayed recommendations for new targeted lockdowns until today, finally coming out with a suggested list of closures, including partial to full closures in nine cities in Israel. The cities are Bnebrak, Jerusalem, Bet Shemesh, Ashdod, Ra'anana, Ramle, Lod, Kiryat Malachi, and Modi'in Elite though the final decision has yet to be made. Instead, health officials are trying to ease pressures on the healthcare system, reportedly planning to reduce COVID testing by tightening criteria for getting a test and cutting follow-ups for those testing positive in favor of simply increasing quarantine from two weeks to four. Finally, failing to meet deadline, the government is delaying the release of financial aid for workers and businesses hurt most by the ongoing closures. Despite assurances by Finance Minister Israel Katz and Prime Minister Netanyahu that the money would be dispensed within 48 hours of Monday's new restrictions. Israeli singer Chemi Rudner, in response, launching a protest against paying taxes until proper support is issued. Rudner calling on all Israelis to do the same, saying, quote, maybe then, at the end of the day, something will change here. Wear a mask, save a life. Such is the new mantra being touted in a new Israeli campaign aimed at promoting social responsibility. Take a look. Don't give us any excuses. If I can do it, if I can put on a mask, And I can put on a mask. So can you. So can you. So can you. So can you. Initiated by the teamwork of Israeli Army veteran turned Paralympic gold medalist Noam Gershoni and ad maker Stephen Miller, the video clearly speaks for itself. There's no excuse amidst the ongoing global pandemic. Wear a mask to stop the spread of the virus and possibly save a life. Several Israelis who were able to work are now suing the state. I say were able because these citizens had to lose precious weeks worth of income over the government's mistakes. With the renewal of the Shin Beit's surveillance to track the coronavirus, thousands of Israelis have been ordered into quarantine. But many say that mistakes were made and that the health ministry could not be reached for correction. One woman was supposedly contacted through a maternity ward, but says that she's neither pregnant nor spent any time near a delivery room. And another man says that he was in London at the time of his supposed contact, making it impossible for him to have met anyone in Israel, period. So the new Facebook group, Sheen Bait Tracking Victims, has now popped up. Members filing a class action suit for lost wages due to these mistakes. Shifting blame all around over the poor handling of the coronavirus, 
the United States now notifying the United Nations that it will be withdrawing from the World Health Organization. President Trump dissatisfied with the WHO's handling of the coronavirus pandemic, making good on previous threats to pull out. Trump specifically calling out the World Health Monitor for supposedly capitulating to Chinese pressures. There are a number of terms that come with the official withdrawal, though, including meeting the United States' final financial obligations to the tune of $200 million in current and past due fees. And at any rate, the United States' cancellation will also take until July 2021 to take effect, meaning that there's plenty of time to reverse the decision should Trump or his potential replacement choose to do so. Now, a common enemy makes friends of us all. And in this next case, the enemy is the coronavirus. But Israel's new friend is more like a semi-silent partner. An Israeli company known for creating state-of-the-art defense, paramilitary, and law enforcement systems all over the world is now reaching new heights. Elta Systems, inside Israel's aerospace industries, along with another leading technology company, Rafael, is partnering with the United Arab Emirates-based leading technology company, Group 42, to help tackle coronavirus. Israel will be collaborating with the Abu Dhabi-based group in the research and development of solutions to combat SARS-CoV-2, the virus that caused COVID-19. The companies are looking to leverage their respective expertise and technologies to develop cutting-edge initiatives that could benefit not only the population of the two countries, but humanity as a whole. In the UAE, G42 is also operating the world's first Phase 3 clinical trial of a COVID-19 inactivated vaccine, under the supervision of the Department of Health of Abu Dhabi. At least in the private sector, cooperation between the two countries continues to take place, despite the UAE having no diplomatic relations with Israel. Although COVID-19 cooperation between the countries more broadly began March 26, when Israel was missing thousands of test kits for coronavirus, some 100,000 kits landing in Ben Gurion Airport from the Gulf state. Hitting where it hurts, the wallet. Israel is now renewing actions against banks operating in the West Bank in attempts to go around the Palestinian Authority and keep money out of the hands of terrorists. At least four banks across the Palestinian Authority are now again refusing to deliver payments that the PLO directs towards convicted terrorists and their families. The yet unnamed banks reportedly fearing Israeli sanctions that are set to go into effect later this month. One of those banks, though, which took similar steps in May, is said to be the Jordanian-based Cairo Amman Bank. But Palestinian Authority officials are decrying the cuts, demanding that the banks pay the stipends, saying that refusal to do so violates the instructions of the PA government. The Palestinian Authority shells out tens of millions of dollars every year to convicted terrorists and their families as part of the so-called pay-for-slay policy. Israel and the United States long condemning the payments for directly incentivizing terror attacks, especially as the lifetime monthly payments increase on a sliding scale depending on the crime and the damages or deaths caused by these attacks. Also, in addition to sanctions against banks in Judea and Samaria, both Israel and the U.S. have also passed heavy sanctions on taxes and aid packages intended for the PA. Israel withholding tax returns that are collected on behalf of Ramallah equal to the amount that the PA pays under this policy. Ramallah vows to continue these payments, though, calling them a form of social welfare and preferring instead to cut salaries of PA officials and bear the brunt of near financial collapse. Now in other news, Israeli annexation plans that were supposed to start July 1 have since been stalled, yet members of the international community are still condemning the proposal. United States Democrats now introducing a bill that would ban United States defense assistance to Israel for being used on expanding Israeli borders under President Trump's Peace to Prosperity outline. Meanwhile, Iranian-backed terror proxy in Lebanon Hezbollah also vowing to do whatever possible to support the Palestinian people and block Israel's annexations. With such dangers in mind, then, AIPAC is vehemently opposing the Democrats' bill, writing that it would be dangerous to weaken Israel's defenses in the face of today's, quote, unprecedented threats. AIPAC, the American-Israel lobby, having also just introduced legislation with bipartisan support, aimed at securing United States military aid to Jerusalem. Well, a warning before we show this next video that it is violent in nature and might be disturbing for some viewers. An internal probe is underway after what Israeli police and the court judge are calling an unusual incident, which began with a request by police for three young men in the city of Hulon to put on their coronavirus face masks. This video, widely shared on social media, shows two police officers using significant force on a 24-year-old man, tasering him and beating him while on the ground. Have a look. 
תראו, הוא לא מתנגד, תראו מה הוא עושה לי. בואנה, למה אתה מרים ידיים אבל? למה אתה מרים ידיים? די, בואנה! די! 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 תראו מה הם עושים לו, תסתכלו! תראו! די, די, שוטה, בואנה! בואנה! הרגת אותו מכות, תראה, כולו דם! כולו דם! כולו דם! Now, it's not easy to watch. The young man, who does not have a criminal record, was taken to hospital where he was arrested. Police say the man refused to identify himself to officers, and while he did not flee the officers, he did not cooperate with them and talked on his phone while he was being questioned. The police testimony shows that uh, claims that the young man wounded an officer and a volunteer policeman. A Tel Aviv magistrate's court releasing the suspect on bail Monday. Israel's police calling this a grave incident that will be investigated. Meantime, police in Jerusalem are also coming under fire after stopping a young ultra-Orthodox girl for failing to wear her face mask properly. The 13-year-old can be seen beginning to cry as the police question her. Public Security Minister Amir Ohana, who is in charge of police, is calling on officers to show discretion and urging the public to understand that officers are just doing the duty that was thrust upon them. Moving on, Israel's national carrier could be flying back into the state's hands and those who are watching the stock market might be able to get their hands on some of the spoils should El Al find its financial feet again. Nitney Manson reports. The plane has landed. After the fate of El Al hung in the air since COVID-19 grounded passenger flights, Israel's national carrier has been struggling to stay afloat. But the state could now be the wind beneath its wings. The struggling airline accepting an Israeli government bailout that would likely give the state some 61% of the firm. El Al given a $250 million government-backed loan with guarantees for some 75% of it should the firm default. Also included is a stock offering in the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange to raise some $150 million in a bid to prop up equity in a company now $2 billion in debt. But it doesn't spell good news for the workers. The deal demands efficiency steps, which could lead to some 2,000 employees being fired. The state, though, must buy any unsold shares, which could see the airline once again the majority stakeholder. This some 16 years after LL privatized. The aviation industry needing some emergency life support. The CEO of Israel's main airport, Ben Gurion, warning that the country is only days away from reaching the point of no return. From Gaza to Minnesota, globalize the Intifada. These terrifying calls are coming from the streets of Brooklyn. A pro-Palestinian, pro-Black Lives Matter demonstration chanting death to Israel in a so-called day of rage, hijacking the term used by Palestinian protesters, as Aaron Porras reports. The DPI fails to refuse to recognize Israel and calls it an imperialist satellite of the U.S. In a fearsome scene, video published this weekend by Memory, or the Middle East Media Research Institute, showed images not from the streets of Tehran, but from Brooklyn, New York, as angry marchers called for the United States and Israel to be wiped off the face of the earth. Several speakers co-opting the Black Lives Matter movement's inertia, repeating anti-Semitic canards, like how Israel controls the West and how the Jews are colonialist Europeans, while spearheading calls for violence against police and the American public. The police that are around us are not our friends. You should not speak to them. They are our enemy. They are an impediment to liberation of Palestine. When I saw that precinct burn, I thought I was closer to Palestine. When I see an NYPD cop car burn, I say we're waking up revolutionary culture. <laughs> Similarly, marches in Washington, D.C., linking the Black Lives Matter movement to the Palestinian cause, prompting the Republican Jewish coalition to demand that presidential hopeful Joe Biden condemn these anti-Semitic chants. 
Pro-Israel groups on social media are spooked, posting this picture of a blown up public bus in response to these calls for an intifada in America, saying they hope Americans won't also have to fear using public transportation. One of many targets used by terrorists in Israel during the first and second intifadas or Palestinian uprisings. These were marked by indiscriminate attacks against the Israeli public, including suicide bombings, not only on transport, but also in popular nightclubs, eateries, and more, killing and injuring thousands, mostly civilians. Meanwhile, locally, Palestinian Authority officials are threatening a third intifada if Israel goes ahead with its plans to annex Jewish settlements in Judea and Samaria. The PA president's advisor, Nabil Shaf, telling Arabic French media that Hamas in Gaza and Fatah in the West Bank will combine forces during such a scenario. This coming less than a week after Israeli plans to begin the process of extending sovereignty in the area fell through. The plan conjured under the auspices of the United States' Peace to Prosperity outline. Well, Israel's Defense Minister Benny Gantz is responding to a series of mysterious blasts in Iran, saying that not everything that happens there is connected to Israel. At least two of three incidents linked by explosions have taken place at secretive nuclear and weapons facilities. Aaron Porras has the details. Thick black smoke billowing up from the Iranian Zargan power plant, catching fire after a reported explosion near Ahvaz. This, one of the latest in a series of mysterious blasts that Iranian officials are blaming on Israeli cyber attacks. It comes just a few hours before a chlorine gas leak sprung open at the Karun Petrochemical Center, causing 70 workers to fall ill. One after the other, these Saturday incidents following fires at the Natanz Uranium Enrichment Facility on Thursday. Photos of the damages showing a completely demolished laboratory being used for the development of advanced uranium enrichment centrifuges. The Natanz explosion is the second massive blast at a secretive installation in as many weeks, the first being at a missile complex in Kojir on June 25. Iran has produced no direct evidence of Israel's involvement in these incidents, and no casualties have been reported on the Zalgan plant, which is now back to business as usual. But as Iran looks into the possibility that both Israel and the U.S. are behind the attack on the Iranian lab, the Islamic Republic is saying that it will respond should their suspicions prove true. Israeli officials, for their part, are ignoring the accusations publicly. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, as per Israeli policy, not commenting on the charges. But Israeli authorities are reportedly bracing for potential Iranian retaliation. Former head of IDF military intelligence Amos Yadlin tweeting that there must be operational readiness for a response, be it in the form of a cyber attack, missile fire from Syria, or something overseas. And the fate of the already faltering 2015 Iran nuclear deal once again hanging in the balance. Iran dialing up the pressures on the European signatories, accusing Britain, France, and Germany of failing to uphold their side of the accord, sending a vague letter to the coordinator of the JCPOA pact, signaling an unspecified dispute. The letter triggers a month-long period in which all parties will need to resolve this dispute. But should that fail, this could spell the end of the nuclear pact, designed to limit Tehran's nuclear capabilities. The pact has long been on its last legs since United States President Trump pulled America out of the agreement in 2018 and reintroduced economic sanctions. Tensions in the Middle East rising rapidly, Israel now issuing its latest response to threats from the Islamic Republic of Iran. With sounds of thunder and lightning, Israel's new Ofik 16 or Horizon 16 reconnaissance satellite broke into orbit Monday morning at 4 a.m. from the Palmachim airbase. The opto-electronic satellite boasts advanced capabilities and improved precision and follows the Ofik 11, which was launched in 2016. Defense Minister Benny Gantz hailing the launch, calling it a mighty achievement for the defense industries in general and for Israel Aerospace Industries, which partnered in the project in particular. Now, while the launch has been in the works for months, OFIC 16's mission, among other things, has already been directed at keeping tabs on Iran, especially as Iran continues to develop its nuclear and missile capabilities. This new directive also follows several mysterious explosions and cyber attacks targeting Iranian military and research facilities over the past few weeks, including at the Natanz Nuclear Center, the Kojir Missile Manufacturing Plant, the Zargon Power Plant, and the Karun Petrochemical Center. Sources in the Middle East claiming Israel is responsible for these targeted attacks, which Iranian officials now admit caused considerable damages to their sensitive facilities. 
Israel then also now reportedly preparing for potential Iranian retaliation in the form of cyber attacks, missile attacks from Syria, or some other such assault. Israeli Defense Minister and alternate Prime Minister Benny Gantz still playing off accusations, though, saying on public radio that everyone can be suspicious of us all the time, but that not every event that happens in Iran is connected to us. That said, he adds that, quote, a nuclear Iran is a threat to the world and the region, as well as a threat to Israel, and we will do everything to prevent that from happening. Iran, for its part, also now increasing its threatening rhetoric. Top commanders within the IRGC's Navy claiming Sunday that Iran has built underground missile cities all across the coasts of the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman, cities that would, quote, be a nightmare for Iran's enemies. All right, you may recall an incredible new innovation from last April in which Tel Aviv University researchers developed a miniature 3D printed human heart, complete with tissues extracted from a patient. Well, now these printed hearts are being put to the test. Through a new collaborative agreement with pharma giant Bayer, researchers are testing the cardiotoxicity of new experimental drugs. And this innovative process could turn contemporary drug production completely upside down. Because unlike current tests with one type of cell at a time and on a petri dish, these printed organs contain a muscle, blood vessels, and more, and in 3D with potential to dramatically cut down the time and money that it takes to produce safe and effective meds. All right, it's never too late to give credit where credit is due. And for IDF soldiers who fought bravely in the Second Lebanon War nearly 40 years is more than enough. A major conflict that lasted from 1982 to 2000. The Israel-Lebanon War saw thousands of Israeli soldiers occupying southern Lebanon following operations to protect Israel's north. And upwards of 675 Israeli troops were killed. Yet only now are these soldiers likely to receive official recognition for their service. The IDF proudly awarded campaign medals to those who took part in the initial operation. But there's no such ribbon for everyone that followed. So now, nearly 40 years after the start of the war and two decades since its end, IDF Chief of Staff Aviv Kochavi has just appointed a committee to consider creating a campaign medal for Israelis who served in southern Lebanon during these 18 years. And it'll be headed by Lieutenant General Shaul Mofaz, who served as IDF Chief of Staff between 1998 and 2002, overseeing Israel's withdrawal. Now the committee is set to submit its final recommendation to Kochavi and Defense Minister Benny Gantz within the next few months. And Kochavi says that if the committee approves of the medal, it'll include an official name for the long campaign, a qualifying period for receiving the medal, and other criteria for eligibility. That's it for ILTV's weekly review. See you next week.